Hi everyone, the views, thoughts, and opinions expressed in the following podcast belong solely to the hosts and its contributors. They are not necessarily the views of our employers, organizations, committees, or other group or individual. Hey guys, this episode is brought to you by Unify Labs. We had a great time discussing BIM and Unify's origin story with Dwayne Miller on a previous episode. Uh, if you aren't familiar with Unify, Unify works with firms of all sizes as they navigate the BIM space. They are trusted by some of the most impressive design and engineering firms in the country and even work with owners. Unify simplifies the constantly evolving world of BIM by providing project teams with tools to organize their Revit content, control their content library, and ultimately uh, firms or a project standards. Uh, they allow subscribers to gain greater visibility into issues and analytics, and they empower design teams. Uh, so this is why Unify's Revit integrated cloud-based BIM content management and analytic platform is trusted by many in the industry and worth checking out. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Brewing with BIM. As always, I'm Joe Whitney and with me is Dave Campbell. What's up, Dave? Hey, not much, Joe. Another beautiful day. Another beautiful day. Uh, yeah, you say another beautiful day. Wasn't it like 40 and rainy there like all week? Yeah, dude, it was crazy. It was, uh, it was pretty... Uh, weather was not so awesome for the past, like, I don't know, week, yeah. Uh, past couple of days, though, it seems like it's been kind of nice. I mean, it's yeah, it's chilly, but at least the sun's been out. Uh, you know, it's when the, the sun goes down that uh, you really start feeling it. But I will tell you, um, I don't know, I, I don't like the cold weather. But one thing I do like about it is the fact that I can go ahead and stoke up my fireplace and get a fire going in the house. I love the smell of a fire in the house, and it just makes it feel so cozy. Yeah, I miss uh, fire fireplaces and fire pits. Like, I definitely got to get one of those set up. But let's uh, let's introduce our guest today. He's a legend in the uh, Autodesk technical the legend community. The, <laughs> yeah, the legend, right? <laughs> the man, uh, the legend. Uh, when I ask people, you know, what they think about us, all they all they say is like one phrase and it's always oh i love this guy and it's like it's never like i love you guys i love what you do or anything it's always it's always about this guy oh this guy helped me this guy this guy knows everything and uh um you know what i gotta tell you he does so uh (laughs) give it up guys for paul stuva what's up paul hey guys how's it going i gotta say thorough introduction but really it's, it's not this guy it's google (laughs) <laughs> it's all good. Give credit where credit's due. Hey, hey uh, dude, you know, it's funny, but uh, I think I think we've actually talked about this before, but in today's kind of workforce, that's a skill. Being able is. to Google things is, is a skill. I mean, that's, uh, you know, constant uh, flow of information at your fingertips if you know how to find it. Yeah, so we all know how to Google, but do you know what to Google? And that is like... That's that, the that, trick. That's the that battle, is, yep. That is a skill. That is a tremendous skill. Uh, Kevin Clausen got this, uh, you guys have probably all seen it in his office. It's a little, um, uh, like so on badge. Um, and it says, Google that shit. <laughs> yes. Yep. <laughs> Somebody yep. gave that to him. I think a customer gave him that, like, cause he was just, you know, a wealth of knowledge and he's like, I just Googled it and next, you know, next week or whatever he showed up with that. But uh, yeah, that's a, that's a huge skill set. So, Paul, uh, I'm going to blame your millennial generation skills for a lot of you. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it for what it's worth. But here's the thing that many people don't understand is you cross on the technical support side. So uh, for those that don't know, Paul is the technical support manager uh, of like the most prestigious Autodesk Platinum partner, right? Ours. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but he... Um, uh, you cross many disciplines. So like we're, you know, some people have like a silo where they'll just focus on, Hey, this is civil 3d or Hey, this is Revit or BIM 360 or inventor or whatever. You're like a generalist, but you're like two levels deeper than a generalist. And just about every product that, that is out there. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I went to schooling initially, um, to learn the programs just through a technical drafting school, very similar to how, uh, David did, um, and I'm a I'm a big fan of the uh, Matt or uh, what is it uh, Jack of all trades. So mm-hmm. I am a learner of all, but a master of none. There you so go. I like that a lot. I like that. Exactly. I, I wanted to start a YouTube channel called Joe of all trades, master of none. I'm in that same boat. Uh, <laughs> 
I feel you, man. I feel you. The name was already hey. taken, by the way. Hey, you know, um, <laughs> too bad, too bad. Before we miss it on this episode, because I know we missed it last episode. Uh, what are you drinking, Joe? Oh man. Um, well, I've got my big boy mug here. I've got this. Uh, it's probably like a 30 ounce uh, coffee mug, and it's a uh, Teenage Meat Ninja Turtles, because you know, I'm that guy. TMNT. Uh, yep, yep. TMNT. You know. Uh, packed full of ice, a little bit of Diet Pepsi, and the remainder of my Aberfeld scotch that I've been drinking the past three episodes. Finished a <laughs> bottle between uh, these, and uh, then I'll be moving back to some over Holt, and then uh, hopefully next week I'll start brewing again. It's it's nice. time, man. I need to yeah. brew some more. I ran out All of right. it three weeks ago. Oh, did Anyways, you? Paul, man, what are you drinking? Uh, right now I am, it was between two. I have a healthy stash down in the ba- uh, the bedroom. Um, but right now I think I'm going to land on the, uh, Amador double barrel whiskey, uh, that K- some Kentucky bourbon. Nice. You're fancy. Nice. Anyways, yeah. Uh, all about the whiskey. You're so fancy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so fancy. Yeah. He says, okay. as I swig out of a bottle here, cause I'm too lazy to go get a cup. I've got a Ninja Turtle cup, man. Come on now. <laughs> hey, you know, most of the time I figure that's a that's a good, you know, kind of thought process, though. If you're drinking out of the bottle, you're not dirty in a cup. I mean, you're saving dishes there, saving water, <laughs> right? The trick is say, watching the bottle. You, you sustainable, eco-alcoholic, you. <laughs> you're always thinking about the planet when you're binging. <laughs> Oh, man, I am sipping on a Basil Hayden's rye old-fashioned. Oh. Yeah. Like, mixed your own old-fashioned? Yes, sir. Oh, hell yeah. I need to come over to your place. Oh, I love old-fashioned. They are constantly on uh, on tap at my house. I, for that's for like, anybody in the Pacific Northwest, the uh, Edgefield, uh, McMiniman's Edgefield, they have the Little Red ooh. Shack out back. Their Little Red Shack special. It's an old-fashioned, oh, best one I've ever had. Every time yeah. we go there, it's the first and only drink I get for the night. I am going Man. to – oh, yeah, you do disappear when we do the um... – <laughs> Yeah, the parties. Uh, yep. The parties there, yeah. You, yep. you uh, disappear always disappear. After the shack. First thing uh, to do. I miss that. I – it might be a while before I get back to Oregon, but when I'm up there, I'll, I'll give it a whirl, man. Uh, I, that said, I do have to make you guys both an old-fashioned. I've candied my own lemons before, and this is the best old-fashioned I've ever had. I candied my own lemons. Uh, I probably should candy oranges next time. But uh, I used a little bit of blackberry uh, syrup in there. Like This old-fashioned was the bomb. It was, yeah, it was sounds awesome. amazing. All the more reason yeah, I so visit good, Pennsylvania. So. Yeah, yes, right. come visit the Dutch country. And this is the season to come. This is the uh, you know the classic um, family guy, Quahog, the seasons are changing, and then all the tourists mm-hmm. cram into the state, you know, scene. Um, although that was Rhode Island. But that's how Pennsylvania is right now. It's just like my trees in my yard are like the brightest reds and oranges, and they're, they look so pretty, man. You know uh, what's crazy is growing up in the Midwest, I didn't realize how much I'd miss that, like, the the colors that change like your trees just the different colors of the trees in the fall it's amazing i remember driving up through uh michigan just as a kid we'd we'd go on you know my mom would take us on a family road trip just to drive and it'd be just miles and miles of reds yellows oranges browns just awesome colors dude it's it's something else to see it really is i mean out here you you see some obviously some trees are starting to kind of change but with all the uh, what the firs and the pine, they don't uh, they, they don't change much. <laughs> Not unless they're dying, and I learned that the hard way. Um, so I I moved from Texas, and we had oak trees that we could barely keep alive. Um, it was just so damn hot there all the time. In fact, I think it, there right now, my mom was telling me it's like 95 degrees or something. Just oh my gosh, like it's fall. Come on. Um, but we left Texas. Our trees were you know they're. This time of year, they're just completely bare. They're, they're, you know, they're dead. There's, you know, nothing's to them. They don't really change colors. We moved to Oregon, they're like, oh my gosh, it's so green, it's so beautiful. And I thought that was amazing. And then, like you're saying, David, like I really do miss the colors. That, and I also hate pine needles. I learned that the hard way as well. Pine needles suck. Oh, they're so <laughs> horrible. Pine they suck, suck if you don't know how to use them. 
What do you mean you don't know how to use trick. them? Have you seen? They are See wonderful my, like, fertilizers for azaleas, roadies, and strawberries. Oh my god. In, you lay down some uh, uh, fine needle mulch for in, strawberries, sweetest strawberries you'll ever have. In in specific quantities, yes. But um, Oh so yeah, have, the overbearing four trees worth you had every year. Well I, yeah, so I had twenty <laughs> trees on my property and like ten of them were, you know, you know, hundred and thirty foot pines and the amount that would drop it would kill my back. You. My backyard couldn't grow anything. Couldn't even grow moss. The uh, pine needles were too acidic. It uh, killed everything. Yep. Yeah. I, you know, it's funny. This year, I uh, I ended up seeding my yard because, you know, we tore it up a couple of years ago. And I ended up kind of smoothing it out, getting some dirt delivered. You know, I told you guys I, I built a raised garden and then got too much dirt. So I was like, oh, you know, I'll just flatten this out a little bit, tamp it down and, and put some uh, grass seed. Well, man... I shit you not, I, I put down the grass seed, and then it seems like a week later, here comes the pine needles, just every week dumping on it. And at first, I'm like, well, you know, maybe I'll just let it stay on there. You know, it's going to hold the, the the grass in place. Oh, no, it killed the grass. It killed it. <laughs> so, that's, yeah, that's going to be more I'm going to have to do. Dude, I, I, I mean, I, a week, a week, Joey and Paul, I, I, I five trash bags full every week. Five oh. trash bags full. Yeah, I filled it's just dumps. I didn't. So I lived in that house for four years, and it wasn't until the last year that I actually cleared it all out. Mm-hmm. And I bought one of those. Or I didn't buy. I rented one of those. Um, it was six foot wide. Uh, uh, sorry, eight foot wide, six foot high, twenty foot long um, landscape dumpsters. I had dropped on my property, filled it. I filled it to the brim, completely full. Um, with pine needles, pretty much. just nothing, but pretty, pretty much nothing. But it was a nightmare. But it helped me sell my house. But dang, uh, yeah. it was yeah. it was brutal, man. It was brutal. Uh, and lesson learned too. Somebody quoted me like eight hundred dollars to do it all for me to remove it and all that sort of stuff. I think I was like, no, I'll just do it myself. That's fine. I spent eight hundred dollars, I think, just on the dumpster, and then like another, you know, two weeks worth of work getting <laughs> in the big piles just so I can maneuver. Oh, it, was, it was the dumbest thing ever, but uh, hey, it's done. There, mm-hmm. over it. Yep, yep. Don't Man, miss. gotta love when when episodes start off on tangents. I love the tangents. Oh, I thought this was what this episode was about it was gardening. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what, segues what? that way real quick, don't it? <laughs> what, one last thing about this. Uh, so you mentioned raised beds. I built, uh, when we moved in our house, I was like, oh, this is going to be beautiful. You know, we get sun through this little window of trees in our front yard. We'll put some raised beds right here. I didn't account the pine needles. The pine needles dumped in the raised beds, like you're saying. And uh, I must have, I don't know how many seeds I put in this thing. I didn't get anything but weeds. Nothing could grow but weeds because of the pine needles. Whole yeah, other tangent for permaculture running on that, but we'll uh, we'll get into that off air. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Woo. All right. Riveting stuff, guys. Riveting. All right. Hey, in all reality, Joey, we've talked about this several times, and I'm telling you, when I my next house, just because I don't plan on living in this house for, you know, too much longer, the next one I'm I'm living in, I want to plan to like aquaponics, hydroponics inside of the house. That's really what I'd like to figure out is how to, you know, kind of integrate maybe living walls or something into the residence. You know what I mean? Because we've seen it work its way into commercial um, architecture, living walls and and honestly, buildings being able, of course, to be sustainable, but growing their own produce in the building itself for like the cafeteria, if they have a cafeteria mm-hmm. for different employees, like we're, we're seeing this become a trend in, in architecture. Dude, I want to I want to bring it into my house. I think that it would be awesome. That's a, a trend that I'm excited to see um, for our industry. Like I, I love anything green. I mean, that's the hippie coming out in me, but. You can make a building more green and start, uh, you know, giving it more than just the purpose of being a building. That's awesome, right? It's awesome. Yeah. So uh, Kurt from our uh, Kurt Egley, he has. Um, I've never been to his house, but the way he talks about it, it sounds like a, a beautiful setup. He's got like concrete walls that are like naturally heating but naturally cooling. Like they, one is they'll trap the heat in there, but they'll also, you know, let let the uh, like. They're, they're, they're insulated so well. Yeah, like so, so great, right? Um, yeah. But he's like, all we have to do is turn on a large fan and, you know, the house is cooled down. Like, 
70 degrees. Yeah. Are you serious? Like, that's awesome. But um, I'm with you guys I, on that whole same thing. Like, I want to build my next house. Not me personally, but I want to, like, design yeah. it. And um, It's not going to be a cookie cutter, and I know price is always an issue. But, uh, mm-hmm. shit, if, 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 if you save up and you can do it, do it, man. I know I'm not going to be building it because I want it to stand and last for more than a few years. <laughs> 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 I'm with you. the crap out of it, man. But uh, building that thing is something else. Paul, you're you're quite the handy guy, man. You've uh, you've helped me renovate my previous house um, quite a bit, and you've kind of got like this artisanal effort, like this perfectionist mentality when it comes to stuff. Like when I think of like true woodworkers and like you know the the um, the Ron Swanson like image comes to mind and stuff. Like you fit that mold just a little bit, like where, uh, you, you know, it has to be just so like, you got to do it right. <laughs> like, Oh, you missed that. Also, cut. also known as slowing Joey down. So he doesn't just slap it up there and it falls out next week. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's, there's that too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, no, it's, it's like, it's again, it's that, that master of, or Jack of all trades, master of none kind of mindset. I mean, if I can learn about it, I'm going to learn about it. I just have the, the, the fortunate, uh, ability to remember much more than most and I'm, I'm very grateful for that so you um you're probably gonna end up building your house i imagine like you're the guy that's oh, gonna yeah. build a I've, block I've already got five or six different designs that i'm i'm working on and they'll be consolidated eventually oh nice nice all right so back to the topic at hand all right let's get back to the away from the tangents gosh, gosh right so, Paul, you are, again, the jack of all trades, and you say master of none. I know you're a master of some. I've uh, I've seen some of your handiwork. You you build your own, you know, uh, board games. You uh, do, you know, renderings and stuff in, like, Maya. You, uh, you know programs better than most people, and, um, dude, you're quite the handyman. So I just want to say um, you're, you're not a master of none. You're probably... The closest thing to being a master of multiple. Yeah, well, I'll leave that to others to confirm. I just tell people, hey, I just work here. Uh, <laughs> and I Google everything. Ah, <laughs> uh, nice, nice. <laughs> so, but thank you for that. It's, it's, uh, it's, I want to be that old man at the end of the day when uh, somebody, something breaks down in their house. They know, hey, Paul down the street will know how to fix it. Go get him. I like it, so, man. I like that. That's like, yeah. that's like a a fulfilling value to have in life. Absolutely. To know that you can be needed. I guess that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So with, with tech support, I mean, with all these programs and, and learning them and the complexities of them, I mean, it's the Autodesk products just continue to grow and grow and grow. And then on the Bluebeam side, um, Bluebeam is in the same boat. I mean, it's one of the other products I support. And then we're, we're getting into since TopCon, uh, came on board with us um or we came on board with topcon i guess uh learning a lot more of that field software and the workflows moving from the field software into the civil software eventually moving over into the uh building design i mean it's it's just due to sheer necessity with the the types of calls we get i mean you gotta understand at least the initial workflow and the basic design intent of each program to even be able to start to support it and that's uh that's something I'm trying to instill in our team and something that uh, a lot of people uh, kind of take for granted. I mean, yeah, Google, and I joke about it a lot, but if you don't know the program, you aren't going to know where to start with Google because well, half of the errors that come out of those programs lead you down a rabbit hole anyway. Yeah, a thread that's 10 years old, that that error code used to mean something different. Been down that tangent, uh, that, that segue before. Um, but that said, so you brought up something about, um, field in the office. So, um, I spent a lot of time in magnet field. I spent a lot in magnet field and magnet field layout and the magnet products as well as the Autodesk products these days and having, you know, your team that's diversified and that can speak to both applications and the cross training, because, um, it is, you know, it's easy to get bare, you know, bury your head and say, okay, well, we, we specialize in this silo of products, but then, what do you do when somebody has an issue with importing or exporting from something else? Do you guys just point your fingers back and forth at each other and say, Oh, that's not my problem. That's their problem. <laughs> that's, no. You, that was, yeah. It, <laughs> that, it's all about the interoperability. Yeah. Well, they used exactly. to be right. So, yeah. So, so you've well, done that's really what I wanted to, 
I wanted to touch on that as well, Joey. I mean, that's perfect, uh, especially with Paul, because, you know, Paul, you, you do, as Joey's kind of said, you, you, you kind of bounce around from product to product to product. I mean, you support all the entire Autodesk, like AEC collection, as well as Bluebeam, as well as many of our Topcon products. Um, so I, you know, one of the big reasons why we thought this would, would also be beneficial is that, you know, you see how these kind of softwares work together. And sometimes when they don't, you know, we have to make these workarounds, right? But essentially, we're seeing everything kind of in the age today of interoperability. You know, we're kind of touching back on that again. But everything, I, I guess, needs to be able to work with something else. And, and I mean, you, you being on the front line and working with people every day with, with tech support and things like that, also, you know, having workflow conversations, are you are you seeing that? Are you, are, are you seeing that as in, um, you know, that, that we're, we're seeing this more communication, I guess this broader kind of yeah, communication. Yeah, I, I get where you're going with that. Um, so I would say particularly in the past couple of years, I've seen a lot more push uh, for a, a, I'm going to say a more fluid or a more efficient back and forth between teams of different specializations and, and um, different parts of the design process. Because, uh, and particularly, and I know that, that COVID kind of hit us, and, and that's obviously something to take into account with a lot of the, the collaboration space and working together. But COVID kind of hit us and, and threw everybody for a loop. But I have to say the one thing that I've seen that I've, I've been almost kind of sort of that silver lining of the uh, the work from home that's been going on is collaboration and communication between teams, I would say has almost become more efficient mm -hmm. now, like for ideas and brainstorming and that kind of stuff, obviously being in a room with another person is a hundred percent better than doing it over virtual meeting. But the, the collaboration, the talking back and forth, the, the interaction between design teams and moving from one software to another, I there's been an evolution or at least we're mm -hmm. in the middle of one. Well, There's yeah. a lot more communication and the software that was available that everybody knew was available, but nobody really wanted to dive into. And now everybody kind of has to. Yeah. It's <laughs> we've started to see a shift. And I, I particularly in these last nine months or so, there's been a real hard shift towards um, finding those workflows, finding those workarounds if needed, um, what products will accept what uh, product types or file types. Um, there's been a lot of those calls coming in and working with how people can get data out of these different file types and into different programs. And it, yeah, so I would say it, it's definitely been a trend and it's definitely something that uh, <clears throat> now that everybody's been forced to be exposed, it's only going to continue. So yeah. You, yeah. you mentioned something there real quick. You said that um, the project or the, uh, the people um, working in the same space is, uh, you know, a hundred times better than, than a collaboration in the cloud. And I will say for collaboration, yes, but for documentation, forcing people to uh, interact via a platform allows us to kind of record every change that gets made, every every conversation that gets had. Essentially, everything has a recording of it. Uh, we know, you know, especially if it's done through, say, BIM 360 or uh, any of the other uh, collaboration platforms, all that information is tracked. So there, there's an added layer of, of it, too. Yes, the downside of that, though, is oftentimes... Uh, it's harder to put into words what it's easier to say. You can sense my tonality. I could just lean over and show you. Like there's a there's a whole lot of you know in-person interaction that's hard to mimic uh, at least naturally um, or on online. But I just want to say like that added level of of uh, documentation is like that. That's an amazing perk. Well, I think I think taking it a step further from that. Um, I know I, I just released that article yesterday kind of talking about this, but you're giving everyone a common data environment, right? That's the oh. big thing here. And that's, that's huge oh. right now. Wait, 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 you, you released an article. Can you, can you tell us about it? Oh, oh yeah. So <laughs> I wrote, I've never heard of this article. Man. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote no, this not article. at all. The ones we've not at all, and, right? and worked through. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I, I, for everybody who's listening, Paul is like my, uh, my, my grammar checker, He's, he, he goes over all of my articles and stuff to make sure, because I tell you what, I miss commas or I like run on sentences. So I figure the more I can say with one sentence, the better. But your, your <laughs> paragraph structure is unique as well. 
<laughs> one page yeah. is one paragraph. Hey, I love it. Hey, man, I tell you what, <laughs> I uh, I just let the thoughts kind of flow out as they're going, and I just keep going and going and going. And uh, then when I get to the end of it, I'm like, ah, shit, I'm burnt. Uh, what do I do with this? <laughs> Hit tab here. Enter here. Cool. <laughs> Paul, the first thing he said when I called him and I sent him the, the article, he goes, holy single spacing. <laughs> <laughs> I can't read any of this. It's too tight. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you know, I, I talked about, you know, bridging, bridging that gap between the civil space, bridging the gap between the building information, you know, space, and then tying it all back together with the construction space and really, you know, what I like, I, I called SIM, you know, construction information modeling, because that's really what I think our, our end goal should be, where everybody's kind of thought process should be, no matter if you're in the conceptual phase, you know, you're in the construction documentation, wh wherever you are in the, in the, you know, life cycle of that project, it, the end goal is always the same. It's, it's finishing this project successfully. You know, whether you're just involved in a, in a portion of the design process, it doesn't matter. We need to move away from that mindset of, you know, I need to save time and money on this project so I come out successful I, and maybe cut corners here and there or, you know, leave out information that I know could be viable because it saves me time. Like, I, I get that. But at the same time, with the end goal in thought, like in your mind, right, we're, we're designing this for the purpose of construction. And again, um, getting everyone involved in that common, you know, data environment, giving everyone access as they need to, um, it really helps us kind of start seeing, again, as we're kind of talking about here, these uh, kind of bridges between the workflows, right? The communication between different softwares and um, just really tying everything together. And, and it's really with that common data environment that I feel like, again, that collaboration and the communication really starts to well again flow better but you know joey you're talking about with the documentation level I, I i think it's i think it's everything right i mean i those metrics are huge yes i know that you know wanting to track everybody you know micromanaging as it seems i i, I get that but at the same time i think that again the analytics that are possible the metrics that we can pull with this data and if we're keeping everybody intertwined you know if i create an issue i assign responsibility or Let's even say we're in the we're still in the design phase, but maybe schematic design, and we have a contractor, the, the general contractor who maybe assigned this project or who is on this project is can actually get involved with our designs and our drawings early on and start doing constructability reviews to communicate and say, hey, this isn't going to work. We need it like this. Yeah, it's it's not about micromanaging. Uh, so I probably worded that incorrectly, but it's about um, risk and responsibility. Who yes. made what change where, who approved what change, and uh, who's ultimately responsible for that? Was that the engineer who asked me to make a change? Like, who, yep. who's responsible for, for that? And having documented communication is very important. But the two, mm -hmm. to your, what you're saying, the metrics are amazing. So uh, I was a big fan of BIM 360 in the early days um, when we were talking about predictive analytics and AI. And, you know, it's only grown better. Because now we can bring in uh, dashboards and stuff from other other platforms. Uh, but being able to say we're in the construction phase now, being able to track, hey, what two subcontractors on what on this type of project, you know, uh, gave gave this type of issue. Um, three projects from now, those same types, those same two subcontractors on the same type of project, I get a warning saying, you know, something to the effect of, you know, hey, you're 33% more likely to get an OSHA violation at this phase, something to be aware of. And I'm probably oversimplifying it more than I should, but essentially something to that effect where um, we're looking at metrics and the only way to actually analyze metrics is to capture it. So if we're capturing data, if people are going to the cloud to get all this data in there, then we are actually uh, being able to run reports on it and figure out and, see, you know, benchmark and, and, and get a better understanding of where we're going. And honestly, yeah. that's, the, that's the best benefit. The more data you have, the more data you can glean from. It can be overwhelming, it can be scary, and you can waste a lot of time looking at it. The good benefit here though is uh, the metrics and all that stuff are, are pretty um, uh, out of the box. Yep, yep, I agree. And I, I mean, they're all there. They take a look at all the issues, design issues, you know, field issues. The, the one, another kind of big thing that I really love, and I know I'm, I'm kind of talking BIM 360 here because it's what I know, but if you think about any common data environment that we have, um, 
if you again can get everyone access to that documentation, um, give everyone access to that information, it's going to help not only, you know, just the designers, the architects, it helps everyone involved in that project take a look at what they're doing and then how they can, you know, better well improve right that apr i talked about after project review or after action review that you can do and 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 really look at you know how do we do this with this project how do we do this with that project and even with something like bim 360 with project templates right building these different project templates for um better predictability i guess overall of overall success for that project right and i think again being able to have this platform that not only allows us to communicate with design and really pushes our design workflows, but also again, bridges that gap into construction with things like build and, and, and let's say coordination, right? Because coordination is a huge portion of when that project starts to bridge over from design into construction, coordination is, is key. And I talked about this also in that article, but with, with the uh, you know, civil workflows, and, and bridging that to BIM, let's say that we have, you know, a 3D piping system from Civil. If I can actually bring that in and then do a clash detection against my structural model or what have you to make sure none of those pipes are running through any of my footings, you know, that's a, a very kind of beneficial thing that we're going to see being able to, again, bridge that gap between those two softwares, but even those two like disciplines kind of workflows, right? Um, I think that as we start seeing more of this adoption of this common data environment, we're going to start seeing more like that. But I I think we're also going to start seeing an improved kind of collaboration, right? Because, I mean, before, what, this year, last year, we didn't really have collaboration from the civil space. At this point, it's in the cloud. We we did. Uh, It was just not an Autodesk-friendly environment. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. But the tools were already there uh, for collaborating. Uh, I will say the cross collaborating, right? The collaborating between, um, you know, real time design processes mm-hmm. while using um, cloud sharing, cloud work sharing, like in design. That's the new that's the new element. So uh, we can link to the, the Revit teams in a more seamless fashion. Um, it is an Autodesk environment, um, and uh, it does some really cool stuff, like yeah. the versioning control. That is that's my favorite part. Like I usually wow people like right off the bat. I'm like, oh yeah, check out this. And I get in there and I show them, hey, look, here's you know whether we're looking at you know 2D sheets, 3D model, doesn't matter. And I can just show them, hey, look, all right, here's what's added, removed, or modified. It's color coded, tells you by how much volume, quantities, area, whatever. Um, you know, Revit property information, like just amazing stuff. I love it. But uh, I feel like we're diving pretty far down the uh, BIM 360 spiral like we always do. Yeah, yeah, we love it. Everybody knows it. I wanted it. to chime in there a bit, too, is uh, a, lo- a lot of the talk you guys are going over is a lot of theory and a lot of, uh, like, where we're going, what's going to be happening, and uh, benefits being in tech support and benefits being on the, the front line of a lot of these issues and a lot of these questions. I can tell you it's already going that way. Um, as people are adopting into the platform, even if somebody's just getting a simple docs license from Autodesk, which is just that common data environment, your markup tools and and reviews and that kind of thing, Mm -hmm. even companies adopting that once they've established themselves and they've gotten their first project or maybe the first two projects kind of ironed out their processes on the first one, they're getting into their second one. Once people are getting into these projects, it's naturally evolving to start pulling in other people and other companies and other specializations. Like once people have established, got a good project set up and they're feeling good, all of a sudden everything's being hosted in there. And I've noticed that almost 100% of the time when people have fully adopted and moved into the platform, all of a sudden they're bringing in all of their contractors work, they're bringing in all of their partners work, they're bringing in any owner documents. I mean, the workflows are, they're already happening it just it, it's those people that uh, have had the chance to get in there get their feet wet and actually iron it out and, and work it through once people are establishing it's becoming the next natural step and then when they find out that there's further modules that lets them all connect um it's it's a natural evolution it's a it's a good design um and however much sometimes we we might say that autodesk doesn't move quite as fast as they should BIM has been moving fast. I never say that. What are you talking extremely about? Extremely well. 
No, I'm just so. kidding, obviously. But but yeah, so uh, I, what you're saying, it is the next evolution. I won't say of BIM, right? It's not the next evolution of BIM. I think, it, if anything, it's just giving us the full circle, uh, getting us closer to that full circle. Because we've never really gotten there, at least with an out-of-the-box solution. But it does get us to the next evolution of connectivity for project data. And it's happening. Yeah, and that's, that's, that's what we need. Day. Yep, yep. So you know, it's crazy, guys. I, I mean, me not coming from this side, that that side, right? That space, the civil space. Um, this week, getting to work with that presentation of uh, you know the workflow of InfoWorks uh, to creating you know a surface, a topo surface, terrain features, all that kind of stuff, taking it over into civil 3D, and then connecting that to Revit, and being able to push all of that up to BIM 360 and push and pull that information. I thought that was awesome. I thought, you know, really when I got into InfoWorks, I thought I was going to be overwhelmed, but I realized, of course, there are there are a lot other of other features I did not get into. But when I got into Model Builder, being able to specify my coordinate system, tell it where I wanted to reference, and then being able to literally pull up the terrain for that entire area, all of the roads, everything like that, it's, it's in, right? And even of a point cloud, being able to extract those features and then Sending that from InfraWorks to Civil 3D, that was, I mean, that was cool. I was like, man, this is like... Yeah, Everybody that, has the course. same response. Yep, it's, you you hear about it and it's theory and, oh, it's a good idea and, yeah, we'll eventually do it. Everybody who actually goes through the process and realizes, A, how easy it is, and B, how cool it is. Like, it, that's a common mm-hmm. response across the board. They'll have the one guy in the company or the one girl in the company who puts it together and makes that workflow work and then presents it. And everybody goes, ooh, I want that. Give me that tool. Yep. Well, <laughs> I thought, it's, it's immediate. I thought it was really cool being able to bridge, again, that kind of space with that GIS data, like my, the actual NAT coordinates. And, you know, taking that into Civil 3D and then bridging that gap, you know, pushing that up to BIM 360, linking the topography and, and Revit, And it's simply acquiring the coordinates. I mean, at that point, I have like the coordinates in my Revit model. You know what I mean? That's it's been a big thing trying to uh, maintain accuracy, especially with BIM. Right. I mean, just in general, building information modeling um, programs like Revit are not known for their superior levels of accuracy. Right. I I mean, they're, they're just not. I mean, they're getting there. They are. They're getting better. But it's always been the kind of, well, I want to say the CAD-based applications, advanced steel. That's where you're seeing a lot of your uh, prefabrication, fabrication, you know, detailing done, um, still AutoCAD, Civil 3D. You're seeing a lot of these kind of workflows and features still kind of pushed there, right? Because they have that, um, that, that really tight level of accuracy. And Revit, of course, we all know Revit doesn't, doesn't really care about coordinates most of the time right I mean, it wants to know where the building is <laughs> yeah, but... you on the design side say that us on the tech support side go oh coordinates call on the phone line <laughs> oh boy <laughs> yep. yeah because <laughs> I mean, surveyors give a bank. damn coordinates matter man they do oh, it's, you they do. you said gis for the nat 83 thing and i'm thinking ah oh, you know gis doesn't care about vertical no it's it's a, that's a survey survey uh Mm -hmm. Uh, workflow but that said um the coordinates that they will come in on the right coordinates it's the z-axis for whatever reason Mm -hmm. that i I don't know if it was the data i was playing with and maybe the data you were playing with but like uh they told me i needed to get a topographic survey of my house and david i told you this before but what i did is i I started in infoworks i you know used the train modeler you know cropped down got just over the spot over my house and pulled that uh data kicked out of surface brought in civil 3d Brought it into Revit, plopped it underneath my house, but the Z was just way off. But once you mess with those bounding boxes and, and uh, sorry, view planes, it's uh, it shows right up, man. You yeah. Just gotta, yeah. So the coordinates, right? It's Z that that is uh, askew. Yeah, dude, it was it was it was great being able to lock it in. Like when I when I brought the scan in, when I brought the scan itself in, um, then I realized a little bit of. Thank you. Depending on how the scan was put together, you know, we we have this conversation quite a bit, but you got to make sure that the person who's scanning knows what they're doing. Right. In, in the sense of they need to put in like the actual coordinate system. And it depends on how they do it. If they put it in, it's arbitrary or if they don't get enough overlap, things like that, that can really offset the processing kind of part of it. But also 
when you push it forward into something like InfoWorks. And if I'm doing, you know, I'm going to say this is here, it's in, let's say, Connecticut. Um, if the point cloud itself and the scan was done, if it's not put into the rec coordinate system, it's not going to, it's not just going to let you say, hey, this is, no, it's really here. No, it doesn't, it doesn't let you do that. It says, no, this coordinate system was used to make this scan. Uh, we're going to keep it on that. And it was, it was kind of an interesting learning uh, experience with that, you know, just being able to see, okay, well, I, I got to export this, I got to do this, and this is how I can kind of reposition it, transform it, right, and, 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 and get it to the right coordinate system. So that was interesting. But being able to even start it off with that model builder, I felt like being able to specify the coordinates of exactly where this is and then take it again into, into Civil 3D and then push it forward in, into Revit, like, of, of course, having the surface and the, and the right coordinates, those are huge. Of course, you're, you're, you're talking about accuracy. Let's say if you're going on to an existing site for rehab, right? We got a rehab project. You want to make sure that you know where all those site utilities are, all the existing pipes are, things like that, especially for doing any excavating or really anything for that site. And we need to be able to, you know, transition that data uh, at an accurate level. And I think, again, not only being able to do that, you know, connecting these BIM to SIM workflows, that's, that's huge, but also, again, tying back to that common data environment, we can host this information where any of our teams, such as layout in this case, might need to look at it, right? And if, as we're kind of talking about it, is all of these models are linked together. That's the huge thing, as Paul kind of pushed up there, that is the big thing, being able to see these links as they update. It's going to reflect in your model, whether, you know, the changes are done in Civil 3D. We can affect, you know, if it's stored on BIM 360, when that's saved, it's going to update that version. And I can reload that into Revit, right, and instantly have those changes or even linking other Revit models to Revit models. I mean, that's it's a huge part of our workflow and being able to do that now, it's, it's key. It's really key. I agree. But so... You know the the whole sim conversation. Uh, we're we're talking about theoretically. Paul, you're saying that it's it's real place on the on the support side. Have you seen another uptick in any other um, support issues that you know this whole land of COVID that we're in, right? You know, I, you and I are we're support brothers. You and I both came from the support side. Um, uh, you know, way back when I don't even know how many years ago. Um, <laughs> But like it was always like the same 10 issues over and over, you know, do some implementation installs, you know, uh, create some deployments, uh, help with stuff. And then Autodesk, you were saying Autodesk creates, you know, these tools keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And there's more tools now, more more features. Um, so is it still the same 10 features or 10, still 10, ish, 10 issues with the occasional corrupt file thrown in or uh, deployment creation? Or has COVID kind of expanded your your issues uh, and it, or has it even, you know, maybe it's still 10 issues, but is it a different 10 issues? Yeah, uh, good question. So, I mean, for a long time there, uh, you had your generic um, AutoCAD, uh, well, base every support company that does Autodesk support. I mean, I mean, just about every support company that does IT support of any kind. Licensing and activation of your products is always the number one. I mean, those those are the cases that are your bread and butter. They come in all the time. Um, but as for the, uh, the the common ones, I would say that the, the common calls have mostly uh, – they've diminished a bit over COVID. People are researching a little bit more proactively. I've noticed a lot more um, self-learning, um, and it's people with time at home being able to actually invest in, in learning about the issue. So we're getting a lot of people that call, and when they call, they're like, hey, I've been researching this for like half the day. Um, I'm just not sure how to fix this. Uh, and I would say – it's not so much that we have common calls anymore so much as we have a common type of call and it's a, Hey, so I've been researching this for the past two, three, four hours, or, Hey, I've, I, I was working on this all last week and I didn't get anywhere. Um, so I've, I've noticed an uptick in independence uh, amongst a lot of the Autodesk and the, uh, the other product users. Um, but I would say that the, the biggest common uh, calls that we get right now are BIM 360 setup and just questions about general performance. You can tell everybody is now in that environment or moving into that environment, and everybody has questions. And I, I want to stress that for anybody listening, too. If you're in BIM 360 and you're just getting into your project, or heck, if you just got invited to a project, 
everybody's asking questions right now. You are not alone if you have questions and you're diving in. I would say that probably 60 percent of my time right now is spent hopping on a quick call with a small team and walking people through how to connect, how to sync best, why did my model corrupt, um, why am I not able to access this through the BIM 360 desktop connector. Most of our support right now has been based around helping out with uh, BIM 360 adoption and project rollouts. Um, and that's why I say uh, you guys talk about it and it's it's happening. It's happening in real time. It's It's going on everywhere right now and everybody's got questions. Yeah, I know the first month of COVID, um, I had a pivot back, right? So I used to do a lot of the BIM 360 stuff. That first month of COVID, I was doing BIM 360 demos and setups all, you know, back on the West Coast, across the country for other people um, instead of, you know, the role that I'm in now. And most of it, again, was around setup. How long does it take for that initial like, oh, you know, I've, I've been loading this model forever. And it's like, well, is this your first time? Yeah. OK, well, then this is why ever after that, it's just the deltas. So are you spending a lot of your time just communicating that or are you actually physically like doing the walkthrough and showing them? All right. You, the best way to link this is here. Oh, do you want to do live linking or uh, publish consume? Yep. Oh, what's yep, the difference? Exactly. Okay. So the, the majority of the calls uh, right now are they've set up their first project. Um, and if they didn't necessarily have the chance to do an implementation call with uh, somebody on our team or somebody on a team anywhere, um, if they haven't had a chance for an implementation call, usually it's a, okay, here's everything you've done and here's everything you shouldn't be doing. Um, so that those are always the the fun ones. And then the other ones that we, we do get the implementation calls um, and they do have a little bit of that setup history, it's always around the linking. How do I link? How do I control access? Because everybody is, is wanting to make sure that their intellectual property is staying their intellectual property, that everything is uh, contained and safe. And it's uh, it's all about linking and uh, maintaining models. Um, I've noticed a trend and uh, it's something I'm, I'm working on documentation for it right now, but um, BIM 360 is almost a godsend for uh, identifying Revit corruption early. Um, so a lot of Revit firms will call in and, oh, I can't get my model open today. Um, it's telling me I've got too many missing elements or I've got this or I've got that. Um, and it, models corrupt. You got to recover from an older version or you got to go in and figure out which families, if you can get into the model of corrupted. But we've, we've noticed a trend recently with we'll have one user on a team of 10 to 50 users working on a Revit model, right? And this one user cannot access either a sheet, a view, or a tool set or something. It just keeps crashing on them. And we'll do a bunch of testing. We'll go through, we'll repair, we'll uninstall, we'll reinstall, we'll uninvite them from the project, reinvite them to the project. We'll go through that whole process. And, and recently we've noticed, it's like, okay, hey, this is clearly something wrong with the model. And everybody's like, well, no, because everybody else can access the model. I'm like, no, you give it give it a week, two weeks or so, and I can guarantee you, you're going to start having issues. And sure enough, um, we've started to notice those one-offs that we just can't figure out why the issue is occurring. It ends up being one of the models in the space um, is either corrupted or is missing elements. Um, and so it's it's been a trend recently. Um, it, it's helping us identify when one of the models is bad or has some uh, some bad data in it. Um, so we've been able to recover models a lot more proactively. Um, so that's been another one of the big ones is not only just training, but when you can't access the models or when specific users are having issues, we're we're seeing a little bit of a, an unintentional um, support kind of kicker there where we're able to identify things before it gets to the point where you absolutely can't open the model anymore. So that's been a lot of it. That That's actually pretty cool. That's a, a cool unintended thing. I usually freak out when somebody sends me a message saying, hey, look, I can't, uh, you know, for whatever reason, I can't get in the project or it's not showing files. And, oh, man, I got like remote in and spend half my day resolving this stuff. But uh, that's actually like something I didn't think about was there's a corruption in the model. I mean, we all know that happens, but it being an early detector, so it's not further corrupting the model for everybody else. Yeah, it's been a it's been an interesting trend, and it's it's definitely um, it's been a consistent method for identifying corruption. We've had a couple where a, a mechanical firm most recently was trying to get into a section view, and it just would not open. Like anything we did, just crashed the program every time we tried to open the view. 
Um, and finally, I said, you know what? I think you just might be the lucky one who's seeing the issue. Give it a week. I'll bet you you're going to have other people seeing issues. It was just a gut feeling, kind of rolling with it. And sure enough, by the end of the week, the R couldn't get into their model anymore, and it cascaded downhill. And as soon as they resolved the issues in the main architect model and put it back up and hosted it back up, suddenly our user was able to get into our section views again. <laughs> so it was uh, it, it's been an interesting kind of kind of workflow to, to identify and watch for that common denominator and and bring it back around to say, hey, you need to go talk to these guys and tell them to recover their model before they have an issue. So you, so. you said you said two things in this uh, this question that really stuck out. Uh, one was um, you were in the middle of doc, you're in the middle of documenting this stuff. Um, for those that I know, Paul is the king of documentation. Which David, you said this earlier in the call where you go to him with all your your edits and you need a you need an eye on something. I do the same thing. He's he's the he's the guy for formatting and um, he might not read all the content, but damn it, he'll tell you what what'll you know where things could shift to make it look better and. Oh, you should move this to this. Like you've just got a knack for that and documenting everything. Um, that said, uh, you've put some amazing documents together. Some that Autodesk was, came back to us and like, we would like to use this. Like this is tremendous. One is your quick start guide um, that everybody loves. Like that thing, we put that on LinkedIn and on our website. I don't know how many times it was downloaded, probably a thousand times or something. Like that thing is. I was say, I wasn't aware of that. That's cool. Yeah, it's, uh, it's widely spread. Everybody loves it. So you did a great job there. And two, so when you started this, uh, this question, you said that um, you think people are being more self-sufficient. They're investing more time on their own. Like, oh, I've, you know, I put three or four hours into this. And I was just thinking, it got me thinking, it's like, well, oh, man, are they like that slow that they put three to four hours in there? Like, they just don't have that much work. And, I, you know, maybe in the earlier days of COVID, that was probably the case. But now I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking most of us that are working from home, I, I don't know if you guys are like me, but I am always at my computer. My phone rings. <laughs> yep. Somebody needs something. I run down. Like, it's it's attached. Like, it, there's so much ease of, ease of use that I feel like I'm probably working more and longer longer hours i feel like i've also got a yeah but i also feel yeah. like i've got a better quality of life because you know i do take a break and i'll walk around the block with my kids or dave and i always talk about this like oh, you know what we'll uh we'll post some meat out and you know let it marinate and then you know two hours later we'll go and throw it in the smoker stuff that we wouldn't do if we worked in an office right but like you know it's <laughs> yeah. uh, perks of working at home so there's kind of like this nice work-life balance is starting to flow together like today me and my kids did the yoga with adrian uh you know at, you know we take like 10 minutes do a, a yoga thing together and you know whatever like just do something but uh I, you know i get a you know phone call at seven o'clock at night i answer it i, I don't know why it's a a bad habit that I probably need to break myself of. It's, a, it's a bit of a blurring of lines. Yeah, we noticed that early on too. Is and that that's a good point. Is that, that it may not be that they're they're slow per se, but that they just they get up in the morning and rather than doing their regular morning routine, first thing they do is turn on the computer and grab a cup of coffee while they're still in their pajamas. Um, so you, you get a lot of that, and that's that's exactly it. And I don't think it's necessarily. Um, people uh having issues with finding the content so much as they're now interested in trying to find the content they're exercising a muscle they haven't exercised either in a little while or maybe ever usually you got that guy in the cubicle next door to you that you can just pop over and say hey do you know what's going on with this or you got that one person in the office who knows what they're talking about most of the time or or you give our support line a call and you get your answer relatively quick um but yeah i was just about I to say that just it's Why a stop want being for self improvement. Yeah. Well, <laughs> we're more than happy to let people know, hey, give us a call. You don't need to rack your brain. But just in talking with people and, and especially the people working from home, people still working in the office, um, we're still getting the regular calls and it, it's business as usual. But people working from home particularly, you can tell there's a little bit of a it's self-improvement. It's self-learning. People are, are genuinely interested. They they want to figure out why is this going on? How can I prevent this in the future? How can I, I, I resolve my own issues? I don't know if that's just looking for a little bit of control while we all feel like things are – what was it Olaf said from Frozen 2 there? Uh, this is We call this taking control when we feel like everything's out of control, something like that. <laughs> but uh, and I think Paul, it's got a little for, bit – For the record, Paul does not have kids. He just watches this movie. Oh yes, I, I watch all the Disney. Truth be told, you get your uh, your Teenage Mutant Ninja Cup 
uh, or your mug there. I've got a, a full face Donald Duck mug that is my mug. So that nice. Goes <laughs> nice. Yeah, we're all big kids, man. <laughs> all big we kids. We never grow up. Nope, nope. Uh, real quick, man, are you an 80s kid or a 90s kid? Uh, I am 89, so oh. I am just on the cusp of a 90s kid. Just squeaked into being one of the cool kids. All right. Yeah, just squeaked in. I was I was the kid chasing my older cousin uh, trying to understand Nirvana. <laughs> what does this mean? Why is he so wasn't impressed? Quite, yeah, wasn't quite at the age where that clicked for me. Oh, that's great, man. Yo, you guys had great music in the Pacific Northwest. I'm a little jealous. When I was a kid... Growing up in Massachusetts, New Kids on the Block was all the rage. Uh, I moved to Texas, and um, I immediately became the largest Garth Brooks fan in the world. Uh, I love Garth Brooks to death. Like, I watched his Netflix documentary, and my daughter's like, why are you watching this? I'm like, shut up! It's awesome! Leave me alone! (laughs) Go to your room! No, but, uh, yeah, like, uh, um, you guys, you know, you guys had some of the most amazing bands out of the grunge movement came from the Pacific Northwest. So while you were not old enough to enjoy them, uh, I'm sure you can look back now and say, Hey, at least I lived here. Yeah. Well, at least I, I was here for it. But yeah. I'd, I'd say that's, it's, it's a big piece of it right now is, is COVID and, and people wanting to learn people, people looking for, for that self-sufficiency. I, and it's, it's an admirable thing. People are generally a lot chiller when they're calling right now. Um, well, they've got their side pants on and a flannel. Side. Yeah, exactly. They've, they've got the ability to. I was going to say, but the uh, the site survey and the, and the machine control guys calling in, um, there's still things need to be done. Things need to be done now. And that's absolutely the way it should be. They're losing money by the minute, quite literally. Um, well, there's so, a difference. I am, yeah, there's, there's a major difference there. I, I am down at my computer and, you know, this um, – I can't, for whatever the life of me, get this parameter, uh, this calculated value to work out in Revit. And it's driving me crazy. Okay, that sucks. Or the other side, and I'm not making light of the Revit guys either, but <laughs> I, I love Revit. But it was the the most uh, uh, arbitrary thing I could think of. Um, or you've got this guy with, you know, an, you know $800,000 piece of equipment with, you know, uh, another $100,000 worth of uh, electronics uh, tethered to it and the gps isn't working you know it's not getting a, a, a signal from the base and he's uh, stuck well, out and it's raining cats and dogs and he just wants to get this done yeah what the hell do i do <laughs> like because we don't yep. have um stakes in the ground anymore like the days of pounding stakes in the ground with cut and fill and everybody you know you know you know grading to that those days are gone now it's all automated it's uh machine control so um Quite literally, that is your only uh, method. You've got to get that, get that, you know, pardon my French, shit to work. Um, so yeah, there's, there's like, you know, you could lose thousands of dollars in a few minutes, or um, call Paul. Well, yeah, call me, and then we get you to one of the guys that are. I mean, we've got the field <laughs> crews out there that somebody are that actually knows the field and then, side Yeah, for that's one of my uh, jack of all trades moments where. Uh, We've got people who are highly specialized in that. And believe me, they're just as busy as you want them to be. So it is a, a high in demand skill right now. Anybody looking for something that's going to have demand for a while, you get into field services for machine control and site survey. Well, so uh, say that, but preface that with what region you're in and the season, because the I think the <laughs> Northeast, that's fair. those that's guys, fair. They, they don't work the winter months. Yeah, a good portion of them. Yeah, well, it was something I learned the hard, the hard way, way. Uh, chatting with some heavy civil contractors. I'm like, hey, man, so what are you guys doing? He's like, well, actually, nothing. We don't do work there in this time of year. I was like, what? It's like, oh, yeah, ground's too cold. I'm like, oh, oh, I, I guess. I never thought about that. Well, okay, good good to know. Good to know. Come back at another time. Yeah, yeah. Talk to you in two months. Oh, yeah, I, uh, I definitely, that was one thing I didn't really think about was uh, weather, temperature, all that sort of stuff. So uh, you are you guys are a little spoiled over there, although this week's been kind of bad on you, but uh, you guys got the, the nice, mild climates for both winter and, and summer. Dude, overall, I'll take it. You know what? We're not, we're not experiencing negative 20 in the winter or anything like that. I will, I will take a little bit of cold and a little bit of misty rain. I'm down. I think we all know why Dave <laughs> muted himself now. <laughs> uh, 
Dave's running a daycare in the background. Uh, no, <laughs> yeah, Dave, you're you're right, man. And, and I, I like the building season too. Like the Oregon building season is definitely longer in Texas. Like. It was kind of a pain. Uh, we'd be surveying in February, and it's already 95 degrees out. It's like, oh, my gosh, why is it 95 degrees in February or 100 degrees in February? This doesn't make sense. But um, at least in Oregon, when it's hot out, it's still bearable. And when it's cold out, you know what? It's still bearable. It's just the rainy days that um, can really it's bog things down. down yep. Well, Paul, man, you've uh, you definitely hit on just about all the questions I had for you. Um, support. Um, so – with everything, it, it has changed. Um, COVID has changed the way that people interact with you. Um, but you, you know, just to clarify, you're back in the office 100 yeah. percent, right? You're- yeah, we, we've been in the office. We took the, the first two months for that work from home, but it, it became a little untenable with uh, training other techs and, and getting people up to speed. Um, so set up a plan, came back into the office, and we've been rolling full steam ever since. Um, so it's always happy to take a call, always ready to field them. It's we like saving people time, and that's really what it comes down to. It it feels good to self research and look it up on your own, but hey, if you're down to the wire and you just can't figure it out, reach out. If we can't figure it out, we got somebody who will. Well, you you definitely are the man. I know if I've got a presentation or something, and uh, something's not working out quite well for me, I you you're the first person I call. Um, either you solve it or, uh, you get me, you know, the, the, somebody who can in touch with me really quick. So, uh, um, I'm even less of a jack of all trades than you are. So, um, you, you definitely, you definitely come in and save my bacon, man. So I love it. (laughs) Anytime. I was hoping kicking you out there to Pennsylvania, to get you a little self-sufficient again, though, to tell you the truth. (laughs) (laughs) You, you, You know what, man? Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll say this in as lighthearted as I can. Um, I do a lot of support that I shouldn't be doing. I know because, it. And because the I know it. The, the hardware guys are like, oh, man, Joe's our CAD guy. Let's get Joe involved with this. And they put me on the spot. And I'm like, yeah, I guess, man. Let's dive into it real Give quick. Give me a and minute to shift gears in my brain. Oh, man. <laughs> I haven't had an open civil 3D in like three days. Let me reorient myself. Oh, okay. So you want units? Oh, we'll type unit. Let's go here. Change it to architectural or change it from architectural to decimal, whatever. No stupid stuff. But, uh, or, you know, it's not coming at the right coordinate system. Or, hey, how do I export these points? Or, um, you know, I really want to place this in the family, but I don't know how to make this work. And it's like, all right, gosh, dang it. Let me. Uh, let me crack with this. So um, I came from survey background and I swore after doing, I don't know how many template builds working with Kevin Clausen on trainings and talking, uh, you know, styles to I'm blue in the face while Kevin is, you know, like cranking all these things out. I am like, I am never going to install civil 3d on my computer ever again. And then I moved out here and what do I have to do? I have to install civil 3d. <laughs> yep. I'm like, Dang it. Yep. And we got to beg you to send those calls over. Oh, yeah, you, you definitely do. And, but, but, but to the credit, like, so uh, I, I've answered the, the call a few times, and, and I've looked like a hero, which has been awesome, because I always like looking like a hero. I always like looking like I'm a smart person in the room, even though I'm probably one of the dumbest. Um, but but that said, like, uh, I'm invested now into these uh, these mm-hmm. thin workflows. So you far, I understand the- you. Uh, it, it, that firsthand experience, and again, it's a, it's a self-improvement trend I'm seeing globally. You feel good about it. You hear that, Dave? I'm improving. <laughs> <laughs> we it. all are. We all oh, are. It's part of my COVID education, guys. No, like I swore I'd leave the civil guys behind. I'm like, I'm I'm done with sim. I'm done. Well, I never said sim before, but I'm done with survey. I'm, you know, I don't need to deal with that stuff anymore. It's BIM, 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 BIM. And I, you know, took on BIM 360 and uh, all the, the data integrations. And I love that sort of stuff. And now here I am like, all right, let's get civil caught up. And working in the same state. Dude, I'm, yep. I'm the it same guy, right? I mean, I've been I've been talking about it like this whole time uh, about sim. You know, this week I started really getting into what is um, sim, right? What what is civil information modeling? And and I realized like we we need it for our industry. We still need that bridge. And you know, I've talked on previous episodes. I'd love it if everybody came to BIM, but BIM only really makes sense when you start going vertical. That's well, really when you know well, it kicks I in. Think- 
I think this is something we actually need to put down and talk with some experts about, right? Because while SIM and BIM are different and they're the same, each one has its uh, own different needs as far as organizing, structuring data. Collaboration, communication are key in both of them, right? So that we can start with data and leverage that data downstream, but it all starts with, well, let's communicate back to the original you know, designers like, hey, what kind of data do we actually need? And it kind of goes back to what the owner's perspective is. With BIM, we can say that the building, you know, life cycle, all that sort of stuff benefits the owners far after the construction side is done. But how do you communicate the same level of information in a civil workflow? Because, you know, look, it's just road data. Who cares, right? Well, no, it's not, right? What is this uh, road made of? What are the different levels of aggregate? You know, where's the, you know, the different, um, the gradings involved? What's the structure like? You know, what's the, if we're talking about a bridge, where's the, the cables? Like, we, we still have to know all of this information. So it is about interconnecting it. It is about data structure, uh, which is something that we are going to have to bridge that gap. So I think that as we do more and more episodes focusing on SIM and construction information and asset information, um, I think there's going to be a culmination of things that we're, we're going to start marrying these things to, these these things together. And there's my tangent, guys. Absolutely. Somewhere. No, I completely it's a natural agree, evolution. It's really about, it is, and it's really figuring out what the project needs, right, and what, what the strengths are going to be, whether it's going to be, you know, using BIM for this project for certain aspects or using SIM for it, because it's, it's really all about that individual project and the depth that they need. Well, so there's two things with that, right? So that we, we have uh, two different segments of, of construction. We have construction that's trying to say that every project stands on its own merits, right, its own its own needs it's different it's its own chaos its own brand of chaos rather and it, it needs to be treated as such it needs to have its own project specific information we talk about project execution plans uh that sort of stuff and then we come to the other side of that which is why are we creating different chaoses for construction shouldn't we treat every project or project type similar and get to a manufacturing point of construction where we're more involved with modular and prefabrication and all that sort of stuff like so I mean, there are large complex projects that we can never that can never be repeatable, but there is some level of prefabrication. So it is kind of like kind of cherry picking the best between them and maybe coming up with a, uh, a, a set of principles for each one. BIM would do really well uh, in prefabrication environments. BIM does extremely well in chaos one off environments in the. the the reason is one allows us to control the supply chain and all the flow of information. The other one, make sure that we're doing this right. This is a really high profile, very expensive. Um, the risks are really intense type projects. So it's kind of like both have uh, a lot of skin in the game, both have a lot of different things to benefit. And, and you kind of have to tailor your approach to both. So I think over time, you and I are going to have to kind of pick that apart and say, okay, for the the um, everyday projects, the prefabricated modular uh, construction manufacturing mindset, we've got this type of bin sim data integration, whatever you want to call it. And on the chaos, we, we kind of have to take a, a more tailored approach. And this is what that might look like. Very cool stuff. It's uh it's all moving extremely rapidly. And I mean, I'm sure we're going to be crossing this bridge before long. I was, um, I, was one, I was wondering, what do you think about like, so the future, I know we're going on quite long here with the podcast, but I was thinking, um, you know, so you said that you guys have uh, on your team had to do a lot of cross training, cross discipline as you take on new products as well. How all this whole life cycle is feeding together. There's just a lot that you're doing. Um, what do you think about like when this all starts to come full circle, man? Like you guys, your tech support team is going to be more like a uh, construction IT team, if you will. To an extent, yeah, absolutely. As I, I joke that uh, just due to necessity and the way that these programs are evolving, um, I joke that we're all becoming BIM managers <laughs> because we're learning the integrations between these softwares. We're looking for those third-party tools and integrations to help out customers. We're, uh, we're, we're looking at the full project lifecycle and how they can go from uh, design intent all the way to handoff, um, even sometimes to facilities management. Um, and so while we're not actually managing any of that and getting into the weeds with it, um, my team is very familiar with it. And that's that's the uh, the change there is as these 
processes evolve, we're no longer necessarily just technical support. Yeah, we, we're here to make sure that your product opens, that it fires up correctly, that it licenses correctly, that it's behaving the way it's supposed to be behaving. But then we're also there to let you know, hey, if you're going to try to connect with uh, this person or if somebody's sending you this type of file, here's how you do it. Bring it right along. Here's what conversion tools you might need. I mean, it's the the natural evolution and the way that all of this is flowing and all of it's going, it's pulling industry with it. And us in tech support, I, I joke, we're no longer just tech support. I mean, the term customer support is almost there. But again, customer support is a little too generic. I mean, it's almost time to start looking at changing the name of the team and taking it away from just being tech support to to letting people know we're here to provide support for your full life cycle. Yeah, you're you're like project support, if you will. Yeah, uh, exactly. We, we talked about that in the past, you know, building ourselves out to a project and supporting the whole project life cycle. But in a way, we are we were already doing that because we worked yeah. with the GC or the owner's rep. So therefore, we were supporting the whole thing, and that's just the end up way way it ends up going. And that's uh, exactly it. We uh we'll have a team call in and like we'll get the sub the subcontractor of the subcontractor on the phone, and they're trying to do something. And they go, I, we can't get this to work. We don't have the permissions. We don't have the files we need access to. And so, I mean, we end up getting on the call with them, talking to their uh, their contact going up the chain. And then, I mean, we've gone all the way up to the top level with the architect and, and been like, hey, so uh, so-and-so down here at the bottom of your tree is uh, having issues. We need to talk with you about your file structure. And it, it's quite literally, we're, we're doing that BIM management. We're making sure that that process flows all the way down. And it's it's been a natural, and I keep saying it's a natural evolution, but it's exactly what it is. Nobody intended to be here. It just, yeah. it's yep. the way we had to go. Yep. You, you literally well, are the first line of fence. Of, you need you know, a cape, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Get Paul a cape. <laughs> I, I think it no can, it's more in, in reference to that uh, kind of, let, let's say, construction information management, construction information model, you know, whatever that is, we're starting to see that shift towards realizing, you know, this is, this is about more than just my portion, right? Because yep. whoever gets this data downstream, it has to be up to par, right? It has to be up to a certain level and it has to be able to get them what they need. So yeah. with, with and everyone communicating that and, and, you know, we're seeing that again, just a transition towards it. I think it's um, it's going to be big for what we're like what we're also seeing in construction in the in the side of um, adopting software. Construction at this point is at a new like high for adopting cons- like software, right? We're seeing so many different types of, of software applications come out for tracking, for you know storing of management, the common data environments. But it, it's it's there's so many different things because there are so many different areas in which construction can improve. It is- absolutely crazy to do, watch do, do you guys ever say construct uh, um common data environment or single source of truth so much in a conversation that all of a sudden whoever you were talking to that never said it before start saying it back to you yep yep oh yeah, yeah. people <laughs> pick up on terms fast uh, david uh to yeah. your point too uh like we were just on site here um a couple couple weeks ago a few weeks ago uh on site with a, a, a gc um going over the site they were working on um and i'm talking with this what what must have been probably late 50s early 60s gentleman who is uh talking about setting up his wi-fi extender and he's got his ipad out and he's flying a drone over and showing the <laughs> shots in real time yeah. and i'm like this yeah. is happening um but yep. more to your point with the construction in the gc2 is the 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 shift to noticing that there is a full kind of responsibility that it's no longer just your piece with BIM 360, it seems to be occurring. And I've noticed it in just about everybody. As soon as a general contractor comes on board and that job site kicks off right then and there, suddenly everybody's aware because they're posting issues. They're posting revision or reviews and and tracking those things. And they're pointing out that, Hey, I've, I've made this note on this uh, document here, but really this needs to extend all the way up to the main model. Like everybody needs to be able to see the revision I just made. And they're really pushing that, Hey, you all need to own your piece back up that tree. And so it's right about that time when we see that the job actually breaks ground and gets rolling. It's the GCs. It's the guys out doing the construction and, and 
out getting everything up and set up and running and actually putting the uh, the, the digital into physical, they're the ones pushing that responsibility. And so it's an interesting trend to see because, you know, there's there's always been that bickering and back and forth and the architect doesn't know what he's talking about. We're just going to do it this way anyway kind of thing. Oh, now yeah, they can shove the that back up the tree and they got documentation for it saying, hey, wake up. <laughs> and it's it's uh, it's interesting. They, they can document it. They can take a picture of it and they can prove it to you and they can do it in a matter of minutes now rather than have to wait a few hours to a couple days. And that's remarkable. Yep. Um, Huge. So like, you know, the, the early days of construction technology, talking early days, like 10 years ago, that's so long ago, guys. That's a third, <laughs> that's a, you know, nearly a third of my life. Well, in the man. construction world, but, it is. You yeah, think you know, about in the software technology world, 10 years was well, ages ago. Well, so we've gone through this revolution of construction technology and it's still ongoing. It's going to change drastically. Paul, you were just mentioning about this, you know, 56-year-old gentleman using his iPad and drones and all that sort of stuff, right? Um, you know, 10 years ago, when I'm talking to people about, you know, classic field and classic glue and, you know, hey, let's talk about interconnecting your data. But really, we're talking about two different silos and with your other data silo. Like, there's a lot of uh, stuff, but right, we were talking about interconnecting data across silos, but still leaving them in their silos. And... Uh, uh, getting people to buy off on these old applications. And it was, you know, this was the old days. This was the, the wild, wild west days. But now it's like, hey, look, can you work a smartphone? Damn it, you can fly a drone. You can you can look at scan data and you can actually communicate RFIs. Ah, put that that paper down. You don't need to fill that out. I'll show you how to do an Heck RFI yeah. on your phone and uh, it'll go all the way to the top. Like that's that's where we're at now. You'll get an answer, you know, hopefully rather quickly, right? And if not, there's actually at least documented, um, you know, time that this has actually gone on. Like, oh, it's been 13 days since this guy got an answer to his RFI. What the hell's going on? Uh, it's all documented, right? We have all this information. So now what we're seeing is people are picking up their smartphones because, damn it, who in this country does not know how to use a smartphone today? It's few and far between. My seven-year-old, uh, who won't own a phone until she's 16, damn it, I forbid it, um, grabs my phone and picks it up like it's, you know, it's nothing, and she'll play Roblox. And I'm like, well, how are you doing this? You don't touch my phone ever. But it's, you know, I, I don't know. Like, we're evolving with the technology, it seems like. But, like, she'll, you know, uh, we'll pick up the technology. And by the time that GC is uh, doing his, his punch walk on the third floor, you know, the subcontractor's already on the first floor answering all that stuff, doing a walkthrough, repairing all the stuff that the GC walked through earlier. You know, he's on the third floor right now. It's been a few hours, maybe. He's on the third floor capturing all this information, and the subcontractor's already going through and correcting the work that he had just put in just a few hours earlier. It's it's amazing how interconnected we are. Yep. And how it just, it all flows now. Now, now just, just imagine when we get to the point of real-time data uh, tracking, right? We're getting there with sensors, we're getting there with robotics, we're getting there with this spot robot dog and all that stuff. Just imagine like somebody runs their spot dog through, it automatically catches issues, and then it feeds it back to somebody. And by the time it's probably even done with the first floor, you, you get an alert on your phone saying, get your butt back to the site, you have to fix this. Like just, um, it's only going to get faster and faster and faster. We are in this uh, so you guys are familiar with, um, oh, I'm going to blank on the, uh, the nerd in me is crying right now because I don't remember this. Um, the term for the technology, uh, uh, cost having, but while the, um, speed is actually accelerating. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm not, I'm not up to speed enough on that terminology. Uh, <laughs> someone's law starts with an M. Um, oh, I'm going to Google this, man. And I was going to say, I'll let you practice your Google skills over there. Because case in point, I don't know what you're talking about well enough to even try. Oh, man. Um, Moore's law. Moore's law, right? Moore's so, law. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So um, it's specifically focused on transistors. But what what it, what it boils down to is the, the, um, the speed, it, uh, the technology increases. Uh, it gets, the technology gets smaller. So therefore, the speed is able, we're able to fit the um, double the amount of circuits in the same amount of space. So it gets faster and faster and faster. But anyways, um, what I was saying is Moore's law applies to construction technology because we have getting to a point while while the costs seem to be going down and a lot of people say the costs are going up. I have a um, rebuttal to that in just a second. 
um, while the costs seem to be going down, the technology seems to be getting faster and more usable and more implemented, faster implemented. COVID has actually accelerated. I'm sure you can t- uh, attest to this, Paul, being on the technical support side. Um, uh, it's actually accelerated the implementation implementation of cloud and collaboration and communication Absolutely. technologies. Yep. Well, so, out of sheer necessity early on, and now oh, yeah. out of convenience, people are starting to lean on it. Yeah, they're like, oh, well, you can still work from home. We already paid 900 bucks or whatever it was for the year <laughs> for, your, for yeah, your license. You established. You you're you're slightly good. more productive than you normally are. Yeah, we're catching stuff, and we're realizing you actually do a good job, so you keep doing it, man. No, um, but but uh, my rebuttal to the cost going down, right? So while technology vendors, it seems the cost may be going up, the uh, the rebuttal to that is actually we are catching more information. We're we're we are uh, not only tracking more information, but we are actually capturing more more information and actually well, mitigating. Okay. Yeah, it, it offsets the cost because we are mitigating the risk, right? So we have moved money from our risk bucket, right? Every project has a risk bucket, a risk, uh, a rework, a litigation bucket, whatever you want to call it. In fact, they're actually, uh, those are usually separate buckets. We have litigation, rework, all that sort of stuff on down the line. Every one of those buckets, we actually get to pull a bunch of that money out of and move it back into the pre-construction phase. So all we're doing now, and um, uh, the gentleman from Raken, he did a fantastic job, Brian, Brian Pogue, at describing this, uh, construction is all about a uh, project manager's job really is all about moving risk out of your bucket as fast as possible. So if somebody comes in and says, yep. hey, look, you've got, uh, you know, this issue with, you know, the um, the site or whatever. And it's like, oh, no, I'm back on the civil engineer, not mine. Mm-mm, I ain't taking it. So it's all about like just <laughs> issuing an RFI and moving that risk back on as fast as you can. So um, these tools are allowing us to not only reassign the risk, but they're actually mitigating the risk. Like we're able to do real-time okay, coordination. Uh, construction management is basically a whole bunch of CYA. <laughs> Nonstop. <laughs> it's, it's 100% CYA, man, because it's not if you get sued, it's when you get sued. Exactly. And who's left holding the bag, man? It's uh, Brian did a, a remarkable job. He said it's all about um, hot potato. At the end, yep. you don't want to be the one holding the potato. <laughs> Too true, too true. Yeah, it's uh, watching a lot of that. And uh, and when I started in tech support, I mean, I literally, I came out of technical school. Um, I had no business acumen. I had just stopped working at Home Depot. Um, just kind of evolved into the space here. And learning to, to watch these business practices and just kind of understanding and working with customers, it's it's interesting to see how a lot of these practices play out and how different people handle different levels of that type of responsibility, um, especially from the tech support side. Cause when they go to lean on you and say, Oh, Hey, I've been having this issue for a little while and it's prevented me doing this. You got to find that kind of gray area to not necessarily throw them under the bus when you find out it was a really simple fix. Um, I, I but remember when you not started. necessarily let them off the hook. Uh, there's yeah. a, a little bit of, of politics with the support when it comes to a lot of that type of risk management and that, that responsibility of ownership too, just dealing with people and, and keeping ourselves out of that Sioux loop. Yeah. Not that we've ever been sued, but no, uh, we've never have, but never have. it's right. always we, one of those things that in the back of your mind, that CYA, I mean, it, it doesn't matter where you are. If you're interacting with any of these projects at any point, you got to take it seriously and you, you got to have a healthy respect for it. Well, yeah, a hundred million dollar project. Somebody's butt's on the line, and guarantee you, if they fail, they're pointing the finger at somebody. If you weren't able to help <laughs> them, you, want to you make might sure be the guy. That not that somebody. Paul, I remember, man. I remember when you started. You were, I think, you were interning with us or some sort. Like you were yep, working yep, part time. Part time. Yep. Yeah, I, I remember that, man. Like you were. Uh, I was like, ah, this, this guy's gonna leave us. He just knows too much. Like. You uh, you crossed many thresholds. Uh, there weren't too many people in our company that knew anything about Maya because we don't do digital media like like that, right? But 3ds Max, you're a whiz at. Um, oh, and uh, yeah, you're you're a nerd for that program, man. <laughs> you're, you're you're a very visual guy, by the way. Uh, you're all about the um, uh, aesthetic the, versus utility. It's got to balance out. 
See, I'm a utilitarian, and that's probably my, like, just get it done, it'll work, you know, uh, thing. You're like, no, 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 it has to look right, guy. But uh, I'm going to blame the hipster in you because you're a millennial who lives in, you know, the most hipster city in the United States, so, if not the world. I'm going to blame my mom. I'll take it away from Portland and just pin it on her. But she's Portland born and raised, so, I mean, I guess it comes back around, don't it? Yeah, even though you're technically from, like, the rednecks of, of Oregon, which is uh, Rainier. Uh, yep, Rainier, Oregon, up in Goble. Yep, yep. Uh, were you around for the Trojan towers falling down? Oh, yeah, I was sitting in the hillside. We had uh, – one of my buddies was a volunteer firefighter, um, so we actually had the countdown on his radio for the uh, fire crew down below blowing the dynamite on the Trojan tower. So oh, for the we good- watched it from, what, maybe a quarter mile out? Dang. For those of you guys that don't know, uh, Oregon kind of abolished its um, stance on nuclear. So they did away with their Trojan Towers, which was this whole nuclear facility up there. Um, it's uh, It was pretty iconic to see, although, which is funny, a lot of people don't know this, but the, the Northwest, while Oregon um, has banished its nuclear, the Northwest is actually home to like the largest or maybe oh, the second sh- largest nuclear cleanup site. Yes, yes we are. Hanford, man. I didn't know that until a few years ago. Yeah, uh, we have a nuclear um, enthusiast on our team, Douglas Lordson. Actually, he's moved teams now, but he's still with us. And uh, he gave me the whole rundown on like the the long term history of producing uh, 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 nuclear materials for uh, and processing nuclear materials for um, uh, the wars and all the crazy stuff in between, man. So. Uh, Got a, a good history on that, and uh, we, you know, have some clients out there and stuff. So uh, I won't say too much, but I will say that the um, uh, that's just a, a side of of the Northwest I would have never really imagined. But it being the largest Superfund site, uh, when you look at the history, it actually fits. It definitely fits. We've got quite a remarkable history with nuclear. I say we. I don't live there, damn it. I got my own damn history now. I live in Pennsylvania, home of Three Mile Island. I don't know if you guys knew when Three Mile Island was in Pennsylvania. I didn't till I moved here, but uh, that's where the nuclear meltdown was here. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah, yeah. A little bit of the more you know. The more you know. The power is yours. Uh, anyways, man, uh, we've rambled long enough, Paul. I'll let you go. You have. Uh, you've done a tremendous job. Thank you for spilling your technical support wisdom you as always are a delight to talk to and i can't wait to hang out with you and uh chelsea again because i really miss you guys uh gotta get things used to get over there yeah yeah you know i'm always looking for a reason to come back to oregon you know preferably in the nicer weather where there's no fire (laughs) or rain or riots yeah yeah so right about april maybe Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, hopefully that'll be when the travel ban gets lifted anyways and ton of stuff. But uh, cool. Uh, anyways, man, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I yeah, see David just time. jumped have off. Here. So we're uh, we're done with David. Um, we'll have you on again, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. We'll talk to you guys later then. All right. Thank you, sir.